So today I'm yeah. Today I'm going to be specifically speaking about fascia iliaca compartment block and femoral nerve block. Okay. Uh, so I've got a pre-recorded video which I'm going to play. It's about twenty-five minutes long, and then after that you can ask me questions. And I can go through the new curriculum uh, for the point of care ultrasound. All right, so here we go. I'm going to share my screen now. So this video is 25 minutes long. Can you all see this okay? Uh, no. You can't see it at the moment, no? Uh, I've shared my screen, haven't I? You should be able to share your screen. Um, I've enabled it. Can you see it now? Oh, yep. Yeah, we can. No. Yep. Okay, fine. And I hope the recording comes across okay. So let me play this then. All right, I'm going to just mute myself as well. Bear with me. To make sure that I'm oh, right. Where are we? There we go. Sorry, guys. Completely come out of that, didn't I? Okay. Um, so resume the sharing. There we go. All right. Greetings. My name is Nick Manny. I'm one of the Is Nick muted? Or I'm muted? Um, Nick, we can't hear you at all. Um, I think there's some problem with your uh, computer's volume, maybe. I'm not sure if he's hearing us. Okay, bear with me, guys. So you can't hear the video, no? No, I mean, we can see the picture yeah. to start the video not, and we can the... see the seconds going out, but not the video. Not the video. Okay, fine. Uh, as in the audio is not there, so you can see the mm -hmm. see the video. In any case, if you feel like you may have this um, kind of link somewhere, we yeah. all can have a look at that and come back to you. That might be like less feedback to us. Otherwise... If we are having a lot of feedback, we might actually not be able to play the video. That's what I was thinking. Okay. Um, well, alternatively, I can just um, uh, play, uh, I can just go through the presentation as usual, as normal, and just talk over it. Is that better? Let's try that. Because so obviously the video the... doesn't work. Yeah. That, shall no. we try once and then give up? No, what I'm saying is that I've got the presentation, uh, so I can just go through the presentation and just talk as I'm talking now. Yeah, just to make it more interactive, I think um, the video is essential based on what you're saying. So shall we start trying yeah. now? And then if it works, then we continue. If not, then we come back to your presentation. How about that? Oh, I see what you mean. So try again with the video, yeah? Yeah. Okay, fine. Let me try again then. Bear with me. Okay. Come across less commonly. Right, bear with us. I'm just getting it up again and sharing my screen again. Uh, da, 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 da. Right, I think it's uh, right. Here we go. Can you see that now, guys? Yeah. Yeah, you can see it. Okay. So if I was to play, can you hear it? Greetings. Yes. My name yes. is Nick. Yeah. Click here. Click here. here. It might play. Medicine, medicine. Okay, I will be talking to you. Can you hear it? Yeah. No, no. Yeah. You can hear the presentation, right? No, I think you need to click the play button. About ultrasound guided fascia iliaca compartments and femoral nerve blocks. 
which, as you know, has been used commonly in neck of femur fractures for pain management, as well as femoral shaft fractures that you might have come across less commonly. As you know, Arkham has introduced a new curriculum in August 2021, which compromises of different... Sorry, Nick, uh, we can't hear, any, we can hear, but we can't see any video. Okay. <clears throat> okay, fine. What I'm going to do is then, I'm going to, uh, I've got the slides, okay, so I'm going to uh, go through the slides, all right, and just talk as I'm talking now. Yeah, is that that's right? fine, what? that's fine. Okay, fine. So let me get the slides up and we go through it like that. And then hopefully you'll be able to see it. All right. Can you see the slides now, guys? Yeah. Yes. It's fine. Okay, fine. And you can hear me okay. All right. Okay. So Today, I'm specifically going to talk about fascia iliaca and femoral nerve blocks. And this is ultrasound guided. And then once we go through this, we can talk a bit about the new syllabus for the new curriculum. I'm not quite sure how it's going to work for you guys um, in terms of whether you need to follow that or the old model. I suppose it depends where you are in terms of submitting your applications and so on. So if you've gone through the new curriculum, there are syllabus which we normally do teaching against, but also there are speciality learning outcomes. One of them is proficiently delivering key procedural skills. And under that, there is point of care ultrasound. Now, for the first time, um, Arkham has introduced ultrasound guided fascia like compartment block, uh, even though it's been used for, for several years now, even more um, throughout the UK. And I'm aware that, you know, um, it, it's been done anatomically. But I'll go through why it is much safer and better to do ultrasound guided um, procedure. As you know. Okay, apologies. So now if you um, have a look at the logistics of performing this procedure, what you need to have is you ideally need all your equipment in a trolley and in the, our emergency department, we have a trolley uh, which, um, which uh, holds all the relevant equipments. And also you need the good functioning ultrasound with a linear probe. And the linear probe is, is the high frequency probe that we use either for venous access, as you know, or for the femoral blocks. Now, ideally you need an assistant as well. And you need to have a patient in a bay that they are visible. And this is a, a septic procedure. So you want to perform it in such a way. Now, for safety reasons, it's, it's best if we have a performer. And in our department, as you know, we do have a performer. But generally, it's good, uh, it's good practice to go through a checklist so this checklist will compromise of when you're signing in and then doing the procedure and then you're signing out. So this would be for any procedures, whether it's a chest drain that you're doing or whether you, it's a sedation or manipulation. And in this case, it's ultrasound guidance. Now, I usually tend to have the ultrasound on the opposite side of the patient because it's a lot easier than uh, ergonomically. And I tend to then uh, make sure that the patient is at the right height for me, so I'm not bending down. And I also make sure that I've got the trolley uh, next to me and I've already opened up a wound pack and I've got my aseptic wheel and I have all the equipment that I need in there. Now, you need to calculate how much um, 
local anesthetic you need. And as you know, we either use levobuvuricane or buvuricane, 0.25%. Um, and the maximum dose is two milligrams per kilogram. I know that on the performer that we have, it's already calculated the dose. But remember, this, this block is uh, the femoral iliac compartment block. It's a volume block. Uh, rather than a concentration block. So what you want is you ideally want 40 mils of the local anesthetic, 0.25%. Now, what does that mean? If um, you are drawing up 20 mils of the 0.25% levobuvuricane, then ideally you need to make it up to 40 mils with, with normal saline. Um, Equally, if you're only using 30 mils of the local anesthetic, then you need to make it up with another 10 mils. The reasoning for that is you want that a space, that compartment to be covered with the local anesthetic. Now, if you were to do a femoral nerve block, just a femoral nerve block uh, you know, for femoral shaft fractures, then that's a different block. That's a nerve block, it's not a compartment block. And for a single nerve block, it's better to use a higher concentration of uh, anesthetic. So 0.5% level buvuricane or buvuricane and less volume. And what you want to then do is you want to bath that single nerve block in high concentration and low volume of the local anesthetic. I hope that makes sense. So once you've set everything up, uh, make sure you go through the checklist. Now, I always go back um, and check the check the x-ray. I always check which site I'm doing, because if you're going to be blocking the wrong site, then that's a never event. And I check the allergy of the patient. I make sure it's the right patient and we've got everything we need. And again, this is part of the checklist. All right. So you want to make sure that you put yourself in the uh, everything is set up because actually setting up takes more time than actually doing the uh, doing the procedure itself. So now I've already talked about the checklist and Arkham does have a checklist on the website and I encourage you to look at this checklist. This is just a generic checklist, which has got a, uh, when you time out and check, uh, are there any allergies and is the patient consented and are we doing it for the right reason and so on. And then you perform the procedure and then you sign out and the signing out will be to make sure that, you know, the patient is comfortable. You've applied dressing uh, over the uh, injection site and you've document uh, everything accurately. Because remember that um, this is important for our colleagues uh, further down the line. So if the patient was to be moved to the uh, trauma and orthopedic ward, they might even get the, well, rarely, they might get the operation the same day then you want to make sure the anesthetic colleagues are aware how much local anesthetic this patient has had. Um, now, I'm aware of a practice whereby uh, sometimes uh, people I've seen, they mix up the lidocaine with levobuvuricane or buvuricane in the same syringe. I highly discourage this practice. And the reasoning for that is, it's, it's unsafe. You, when you start mixing local anesthetic, then you lose the sight of how much local anesthetic the patient has received. And there isn't that much advantage in mixing up the local anesthetic because, you know, well, the logic is that you want to give um, short acting uh, or rather fast acting, short acting local anesthetic. And whilst the long acting, um, uh, uh, long acting one kicks in, but I think, um, realistically, the level buvuricane or buvuricane, for example, these will act within a few minutes. So you don't really need to concern yourself with mixing the local anesthetic in one syringe. And I really, as I said, I really recommend that you don't do that. So then moving on. Um, Any check? Um, in terms of the practicality of it, what I tend to do is I tend to use a wound pack and then I open that up. And you might notice that there is an orange bag in there for your rubbish. I tend to use that as my probe cover. 
And that's a trick of the trade that I've learned over the years. So you don't need to go hunting down for a proper pro cover or put a tagaderm and all these sorts of things on there. And I'll have the rest of the equipments in there. Um, ideally, you want a proper uh, nerve blocking needle. And the reasoning for that is, is because it's designed in such a way that it will reduce the reverberation artifacts that you will get when you're scanning. And it's very thin, it's thin and long. Um, whereas what we're using in, at the moment in the department is okay, it, it works, but it's very, it's very thick. And uh, you're, you're then creating a very large track with your needle when it's not necessary. And equally, um, it's not designed in such a way that will reduce the reverberation artifacts that you will get when you're injecting. Um, but it is what it is. I mean, you, you just have to be adaptable and use the equipment you have. Now, interestingly, these nerve block needles also, some of them might have uh, uh, stimulus, um, uh, a stimulation function rather, and pressure as well. So when you're injecting, um, uh, you know, uh, if, if you're injecting directly into a nerve which you don't want, then it will warn you. Equally, you have to inject uh, within a certain pressure. However, you know, for our purposes, for especially for fascia lacquer block, where we are just injecting into a space, then you don't really require that. Now, as I said, just going back to the setup, um, when you have your probe, I usually put a normal gel on it. And as I said, I have the ultrasound on the opposite side of the patient. And I have an assistant. Um, I would have already put it either on the nerve preset or I would have adjusted the gain and the uh, gain and the uh, um, depth uh, myself. And I go and wash my hands. And um, uh, before washing my hands, I, I actually just clean the area and drape the patient as much as I can. And then I go and wash my hands. I put my sterile gloves on. And at this point, I then ask the assistant to pass me the probe and I use the sort of the orange bag as, uh, as probe cover, as I said. So um, I sort of get them to put it inside without touching anything. And then I'll put the sort of the orange bag over it and then I take it over. All right. And what I can then do is um, I can ask my assistant to put a bit of a PR jelly, which should be a sterile, as long as you don't touch the opening of it. And also you give it a clean with a bit of an alcohol wipe. I can ask them to either put that in the area where I'll be scanning, um, or I can ask them to just put some on the probe without touching anything. You can, if you want to use specific sterile gels, uh, I'm not sure if we've got any in the department, but I'm just trying to sort of show you a way of doing it in such a way that you're not going hunting for these things. And then I get scanning, all right? So I look at the uh, anatomy and once I identify the different layers and so on, then I, I proceed with the procedure, okay? I top. Now, in terms of the, um, the sort of, uh, if you like, the kind of the science part of doing this block, you, the indications, as you know, are for neck of femur fracture, all right, if you're doing a fascia and like a compartment block. Some people do it also for acetabulum block as well, uh, which we'll come back to. And you kind of still do it for femoral shaft fractures because, you know, the fascia like compartment block, will you will still get uh, quite a lot of the femoral nerve being blocked. But ideally for the femoral shaft blocks, as I said, you want to use the, uh, you just want to um, block the femoral nerve, as I said, with high concentration and low volume. Um, and sometimes uh, there is a specific block that you can use uh, for pubic rami fractures as well, which we'll come back to. Now, you might recall the nerves that are supplying uh, the area of interest, uh, the femoral head and the neck, and also further down. Anteriorly, it's supplied by the femoral nerve, all right? And um, mostly, uh, you also have some obturator nerve as well, which supplies it on the medial side. So the fascia like a compartment block usually will get you the femoral nerve and the obturator nerve blocked. On the lateral side, you've got 
a bit of a sciatic nerve and on the posterior side of the, the, um, uh, the femoral head and the neck and the femur, as you might recall, is usually the sciatic nerve. So that's why, you know, when you're blocking um, and you're doing a fasciolacal compartment block, the patient still has some pain because you can't get, you know, you can't block in the sciatic nerve as well with a fasciolacal compartment block. You're only blocking the femoral nerve and the obturator nerve and perhaps some lateral cutaneous nerve as well. All right. So hope that makes sense. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to block the femoral nerve and the obturator nerve and perhaps uh, the, um, the lateral cutaneous nerve when we're doing a fascia like a compartment block. Now, in terms of um, probe position, I've done this cartoon to just show you, all right? Um, so what you have is, as, as you recall, you have inguinal ligament, and you've got your femoral nerve, femoral artery, and the, uh, sorry, femoral vein, femoral artery, and the femoral nerve that are running alongside each other. And you've got the um, sort of the groin uh, crest as well. And for the femoral, uh, for the fascia like a compartment block, conventionally we use an approach called the infrainguinal approach. And I'll come back to this. You, you're scanning here. So remember when you're doing this anatomically, you divide up to uh, three thirds and you go between the lateral third and the, and the medial third, just one centimeter under the inguinal ligament. Essentially with ultrasound, that's what we are doing. We are gonna scan where you would expect to inject anatomically. And once you identify the femoral uh, vessels, and the femoral nerve, as well as the fascia iliaca and the lata, um, fascia lata and uh, iliaca rather, I should say, then you will inject under the fascia lata. Now for femoral nerve, you'll be a bit more medially. So this is, uh, this is where your uh, sort of pro position will be. And I've put a cross to say that this is where your needle is gonna go. Now, it is challenging when you're performing this procedure because you've got to remember the beam of the ultrasound probe is only a credit card thin when you're doing it from the side. Well, it is always credit card thin. It's like a laser beam, if you like. And when you're doing it from, when, you, when you're inserting your needle from, from the side, uh, you don't have much margin of error. So you've got to be careful as to how you're going to um, how you're going to manage that. And it takes a lot of dexterity and um, uh, eye-hand coordination to be able to do that. So it requires quite a lot of practice. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on that too much in this talk. All right. Now, there's another block, which I'll come back to. This is just uh, sort of as a bonus, if you like. It's, it's not in the curriculum, uh, but it's, it's up and coming block, which I'll be talking about, which is called Peng block. Uh, pre-capsular nerve group block, it stands for. And I'm not sure if any of you have come across the uh, doing the fascia like compartment block um, from uh, the, this is called the supra inguinal approach. I quite like this approach. This is when you've you've got your probe just above the inguinal ligament and you're pointing towards the umbilicus of the patient. Um, Sorry, I think somebody is not on the mute here. Uh, Talak, I think you might need to mute yourself. So in terms of the surface... Sorry about this. Let me go back. Okay, so the supra-inguinal uh, approach uh, so it's the fascia like a compartment still, but you're just above the inguinal ligament and you're pointing towards the umbilicus of the patient. And the reasoning that I quite like this approach for fascia like a compartment block, which you've probably not seen or you've seen, uh, you've, you've heard of, or you might have seen it once or twice, is because not many people are comfortable doing this. But actually, this, this approach is much safer and much more effective as well. In the literature, uh, this is based on the data. The reasoning for that is, uh, the reasoning why it's safer is because your needle 
tip is pointing away uh, from the femoral vessels. So if you lose the sight of your femoral tip, uh, sorry, your needle tip, then you're unlikely to then dip into these massive vessels. And equally, you're injecting um, much more proximally um, and uh, it, it's, uh, it's believed that it's, it's more effective because it, you know, once you put the local anesthetic more proximally, then as it runs down the, the leg, it will block more of the branches of the femoral nerve and the obturator nerve. And those are the branches, uh, sensory branches that uh, they are. So I hope that makes sense. So now in terms of the, the anatomy of um, what you will see when you're performing uh, the block, I'm just gonna run through the, if you look at the left, uh, top left hand of screen, let's just concentrate on this first. So this is probably the, the view that you might have seen um, if you performed ultrasound guided block. And this is the fascia like compartment block, which is um, infra inguinal. This is the conventional one, all right? And when you are scanning, you want to identify, as you can see in here, um, you want to identify the vessels, which are medial, and then you want to then start coming a bit more laterally to identify these two layers, which is the fascia lata and fascia iliaca. All right. And once you've identified that, then you can go ahead. So you can see here, uh, femoral vein, femoral artery. You will have the femoral um, nerve here somewhere. And then you get the fascia lata and fascia iliaca. And you want to then go in laterally and inject just under this, this layer in here, the fascia lata, uh, sorry, fascia iliaca. Now you might ask, well, why do you want to make yourself, uh, your life complicated and do it ultrasound guided? Now, the reasoning for that is when you're doing it anatomically, then as you know, if somebody is on an anticoagulation, then it's actually a, a absolute counterindication to, uh, to perform this anatomically. And the, you know, for obvious reason. But if you're doing it ultrasound guided, then it's only a relative counterindication. So if you're experienced enough, um, because you've got direct visual, visualization of the structures, you can go ahead and do it. Um, but also the other uh, reason, the biggest reason really is that with ultrasound, when you're performing the procedure, you will feel the pop as well as you're going through the fascia layers. Once you get the second pop, you will notice that nine out of 10, you will go into the um, iliacus muscle, which is just underneath here. And when you start injecting, in fact, most of your sort of local anesthetic end up in the belly of the iliacus muscle where you don't want it. So the ultrasound will allow you to then do fine adjustments to just withdraw your needle a little bit back to then inject it under the fascia um, iliaca, and you get that, that nice hydro dissection, which I will show you in a short while. Uh, that's why, you know, when you're doing an anatomy, you know, you get the first pop, you get the second pop, and then you start injecting, thinking that, you know, most of the local anesthetic will go to where you want it. But in actual fact, it doesn't really. Um, now, so that's that's the infra, um, the infra inguinal um, approach for fascia iliaca compartment block. I just want to show you the supra inguinal approach, which I was talking uh, about. Mani, excuse me, where you put the probe for the infra uh, inguinal? So you put probe where? So here, here, just here, Mr. J. Uh, so you would put it here so that it's almost parallel to the um, inguinal ligament. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. here. Okay, mm -hmm. so this is where your probe is. Uh, it's almost parallel to the uh, inguinal ligament. It's about one centimeter below it, as you would do with anatomical approach. Mm -hmm. And you will then scan, and uh, you will keep your probe in, in that sort of orientation. Uh, it doesn't matter where the pointer is, as long as you know if the pointer is on the right or the left, it doesn't matter, as long as you know where it is and then you'll scan and you get these structures as we talked about. Uh, is that okay, Mr. J, is that, does that make sense? So where we, I can see the, where the nerve is, is can we see the nerve here? Uh, the so the nerve, 
the, the nerve um, interesting. The femoral nerve, sorry, the femoral yes, nerve. Yes, the femoral nerve. So the femoral nerve, interestingly, it doesn't matter which ultrasound you use, unless you use a very high-end ultrasound. Most of the time, you don't see it. So you see the femoral vein, you see the femoral uh, okay. artery, yeah. and the, 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 the nerve is just there, just next to it. Once you start injecting, as you get fluid around the nerve, then it becomes very obvious. Um, now, but remember, we're not trying to inject the femoral nerve in here unless you want to block somebody. You know, when a child comes and they've got a femoral shaft fracture or a farmer comes and they've got an open femoral shaft fracture, then what you want to do is, it's just there, Mr. J, here. And when you start injecting a bit of local anesthetic around it, it becomes much more obvious because remember, um, uh, ultrasound. So, so where, where, you, where you can see the fascia iraca here? So the that's the fascia lata here. So now we're going to, sorry, let me go back. So, sorry, let's just play that again. Let me just fast forward it and, and pause it. So that's the fascia lata. Mm -hmm. And this is the fascia iliaca. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Now this is this is um, um, this is a scanning myself by the way to show you the anatomy. Uh, so obviously in different people, uh, you know you will you you probably will have some more soft tissues or sometimes you know in very elderly, um, you know um, uh, the uh, folks uh, there might be very cachexic and actually you know the sartorius muscle which is here. You might not see it as as pronounced, but you will see it. It's and the fascia layers will be just a nice line. Look, just a nice layer going across. So that's fascia lata, and that's the fascia iliaca. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. So this is the this is the infrainguinal approach, which I've shown in here. Now, so I'm gonna so now stop this video as well. And if you look at this now, so this is fascia iliaca compartment block as well, but this is the superinguinal approach. So can you see where, where I've got the probe? So the probe is called superinguinal approach because it's above the inguinal ligament. And I've got it in, in an in a oblique position. It, again, it doesn't matter whether your pointer is you know, on the top or the, the bottom. The main thing is you've got it in an oblique position pointing towards the umbilicus. Now, interestingly enough, if you can see in here, me scanning, um, what you will get is, you will get the sartorius muscle. So you can see the sartorius muscle in here. And if I fast forward a little bit, then you will start seeing in here, just in here, you will see the internal oblique muscle. Okay, so you will recall the internal oblique muscle of the abdominal wall. And in between, just in here, as the sartorius tapers off, this is where you want to inject just underneath that. And believe it or not, this is the fascia lata on the top here, and the fascia iliaca is just running underneath. So the advantage of this as well is it's very superficial where you can inject. And as I said, you know, you will not be uh, going near any vessels. There are some vessels sort of much deeper down, but you won't be going, your needle tip is away, uh, it's moving away from the femoral vessels. So do you put the needle below the inguinal ligament uh, for mm, the... No, no. So you will, uh, you're just above the inguinal ligament. So your probe is above the inguinal ligament and the needle is just above the inguinal ligament. And the needle won't enter the peritoneal cavity? No. No, you're, you're directly seeing your needle um, and it's very superficial, Mr. J. So you've got the sartorius muscle. This is a well-recognized approach, by the way. Um, you've got the sartorius muscle in here and it tapers off. It tapers off and this is the internal oblique, all right? And you're directly visualizing your needle as you're coming in and you just want to inject where it, the sartorius tapers off. And uh, some people describe it as a bow tie because the sartorius is like that and the internal oblique is, is like this. So you get this kind of a bow tie. And as I've shown in the cartoon, you're just injecting under there 
And as I said, the advantage of this is, is it's, you're injecting more proximally. So as the local anesthetic kind of runs down the, the thigh, uh, it, will, um, it will block more of the sensory branches or more of the branches of the femoral and the obturator nerve. And it's, uh, in the literature, uh, it's shown that it's much more effective and as I said, and I think I think it must be done by a person like who is highly trained in the scan, is it? To be very very honest with you, Mister J, mm -hmm. I I actually think that we should be teaching this more because I think the the issue with um, with 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 performing this um, infra inguinal approach with uh, with ultrasound. I think the biggest problem with this is, is that most of the most of the people, as they're learning to do it, they lose the sight of the needle tip, and the reasoning for that is, is because of the the the, the credit card thin uh, beam of the ultrasound as you're coming from the side of it, and what then happens is, is that as you lose the sight of the needle tip, you can easily. Uh, uh, in, uh, go into the femoral vessels, whether it's the femoral artery or the, the femoral vein, and you might inadvertently uh, inject in those, even a little bit of local anesthetic, you know, and then you realize and correct it. Whereas with, with, with the superinguinal, you've actually got much, much more margin of error. I mean, you have to do very well to end up in the peritoneum cavity. Uh, I have to say. It's, it's oh, I, very... I, I, no, I agree with you, also, but I think once... Uh... You know, for somebody, it's the same as the car camera is there. So when you are reversing, so you, you can't just rely on the camera. You have to look around as well. So, you know, so clinical set of palpation of the artery and the stuff like that, and the clinical set of impression should be there because the scan is aid, is not the absolute. So scan is aiding you to see a little white dot of the nerves and the artery pulsating and the vein there, you know and the fascia uh, lata and the iliaca. So, uh, I mean, I don't know. I mean, a supra inguinal approach, because I know, because I've done quite a bit of surgery, open the abdomen, whatever. The, the bowels is quite close, you know? So my worry is to pierce the peritoneal cavity and chances of piercing uh, loop a small bowel there or something, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I take your point, Mr. J. I think, um... But if you look at the literature and also uh, the folks that are actually performing these procedures, mm. uh, which is not just the anesthetic, is uh, in uh, in the ED departments. Uh, it's no, this is ED, is it? Because we started doing this uh, in 2011 or 2011 in our department in Doncaster. I don't know. When yes. People... So at Northern General Hospital, they perform the, they actually teach much more widely the superinguinal approach. Um, mm -hmm. Now in Leeds, I started teaching it there because they weren't doing it in Leeds, they were doing the infrainguinal and they were very intrigued with this and they started doing it there as well. And, you know, it, it's fairly safe, but, you know, no, no, it makes sense, is it? Because yeah. uh, the, the bow tie stuff, and I, I, I understand the anatomy, the sartorius is going there, and the other one. I think, I think to me, the, the failure of infra inguinal ligament block is because the people go too low, you know? Though the ilacus muscle, if you see the anatomy, it just attaches the lesser trochanter, which is just there, you know? Yeah. And, uh, uh, and the fascia iliaca, Finish with the iliacus muscle because it's a facial envelope to the iliosos muscle, and they both muscles are attached in that sort of greater trochanter and intertrochanter line. So I think it needs to be quite high up, you know. Yes. So as you're scanning, you know, you'll be guided with the sartorius and the and the um, internal oblique. And remember what you have underneath here, this, this large muscle. So even if you go deeper, this large muscle, remember, this is the iliacus muscle, mm -hmm. you know, so, so let's say if you're going deeper, let's say you're going past, so now we're get sorry, let's say that you're going past your landmark and um, let's say you're going past this bow tie when you're doing a super inguinal approach, let's say you go past it. So the needle tip has gone past it. You got this massive belly of the iliacus. Um, 
But I, I see your point, Mr. J. I think what you got... So the to needle hear, and the supraing one has to point to the feet. Uh, well, it can point to the feet if you want it. It doesn't have to. So you can, you know, come from this way or you can, but normally you would come from, I, I normally uh, come from the uh, feet end to the head end. So I'll be coming from here, from where the sartorius is, and I'll be then meeting just in the middle there. Because if you're going to do it from the top, um, you can do it if you want it, but it's a bit more logistically um, you might be challenged the way that you have to wrap your hand around, you know, the, the probe and so on. Um, but if you, you know, normally I come from the feet end to the head end. And as I said, you know, the, the key to these nerve blocks, any nerve blocks or the fascia blocks is that you see the tip of the needle at all times. Okay, the tip of the needle, if you can't see the tip of the needle, then you shouldn't be progressing with your oh, needle. I wish about it. It, 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 it's same as, it's same as, you know, vessel, you know, it's the same as when you're getting uh, peripheral, uh, uh, peripheral access, you know, venous access. If you can't see the tip of the needle, uh, the cannula, then, you know, you shouldn't be proceeding because you don't know where you're going. Uh, so this is the same with here. And as I said, I'll be coming from here, from, mm -hmm. the, from the feet end, and I'll be aiming for here. And let's say if I go past that, the, uh, um, you know, I've got this massive belly of the iliacus mm. to then, you know, to, to deal with. So I won't be going very high up. So I'm not going into the internal oblique as such. I'm just aiming where they, they both meet. The, if we put a probe at the level with the anterior inferior uh, iliac, uh, what they call spine, and then we take bearing from that, is that good or that's rubbish or what? So, so that's a really good point. So Mr. J, this will bring us nicely to this other approach. Which is called the peng block, uh, ah, which is called okay. the we are talking about okay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that that's a very very good point. So the precapsular nerve group block, which is uh, sort of been recently coming around, um, the probe is is here. So you can see with the purple probe, um, which I've put on the cartoon. All right, so it's just literally below uh, the inguinal ligament. Uh, so it's not as low as one centimeter as you would do the fascia like a compartment block, but it's just below it. And what you do then do is you identify, as Mr. J was saying, is that you, you identify the superior inferior inguinal uh, spine, which is here in the cartoon, and you will see it as I'm scanning as well. And then you're identifying the psoas tendon, which I've shown in here and you're injecting just under the psoas tendon. Now, the advantage, so you can see it as I'm scanning, okay? So you can see the inferior inguinal um, spine, and then this is the psoas tendon, this, this round of the structure, okay? And if I go more internally, uh, sort of medially rather, I will see the femoral vessels. So there you go, these mm -hmm. are the femoral vessels, okay? Now, the advantage of this is, this pain block, which has come around, is that, as you're injecting onto the psoas tendon, you're only blocking the sensory branches of the femoral and the obturator nerve. So the motor branches are not blocked. And the great thing about this is, is that if you want to keep reassessing the neurology of the limb, uh, then it'll allow you to do that. And also it's great if you've got uh, either acetabulum block or pubic rami block, then you can only block the sensory uh, branches and then the patient can get rehab, you, you know, uh, they, can, they can get walking with physios and stuff. Now for anesthetic side of it, if this is post-surgery, so they've had their hip or femur fixed or whatever, then again, if you do this block, that means, uh, you know, they can actually get up and walking very, very quickly um, without, uh, you know, with minimal pain basically. Um, so this is a block which I really like doing because you're only blocking the sensory parts of the femoral and the obturator nerve. However, don't worry about this block. Um, the ones that you should know about is the fascia like a compartment block and the femoral block. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm going to try to move so on then just in the... Nick, just, uh, I've got yeah. a question. If you go back to the last slide, yeah. So... Let's be very clear about the position of the probe and where exactly we are actually putting the needle in. Uh, so the top part, FICB, the suprailiac part of it, supra 
inguinal part of it. Yeah. Yeah. So we are going perpendicular to the lateral third, or what exactly is this position? So the infrainguinal, you, you're talking about. No, the this, super, right? Let's start from the top to bottom. Yeah. Superinguinal, right. Yeah. So the superinguinal, okay, the probe is above the inguinal ligaments mm -hmm. and it's oblique. And you're pointing towards the umbilicus. Right. Okay. And first of all, scan. And as you're scanning in that plane, you will identify the sartorius muscle and internal oblique muscle. All right. And you want to identify it in such a way that, as I said, the one is tapering off and then the other one is tapering off and they're meeting in between. All right. So just like that. All right. So as you're scanning, first identify that. And once you have identified that, then the needle doesn't matter even if it goes through the inguinal ligament, you know, uh, but usually, you know, it doesn't. It's just above the inguinal ligament as you kind of, you know, uh, as you enter with your needle then your, your needle as well, remember, is going obliquely as well. You know, you're, you're basically following uh, the same plane as your, your, your probe. Does that make sense? So based uh, on that, uh, it looks like the needle is uh, quite angulated to the femoral nerve where they're like probably 45 degree angle the, pointing uh, up towards uh, the femoral uh, nerve. Uh, uh, It'll be the, the angle will be much much more superficial. So rather than forty five degrees, I would say um, it's going to be twenty to thirty. The, I think I think no. His question was that where we put a probe. It says the junction of the lateral to the medial two third, and the vascular bundle is at the junction of the lateral two third with the medial one third. So somebody has to really try to pierce the uh, vascular bundle if they have to pierce. Uh, you know, they really have to try. Hand system never even, absolutely never ever even, because it should be far away from the injection site. And I think uh, that the other thing is a bit a bit miserable because when the femur is broke, then it's external rotation. So the anatomy might well be distorted, but please always feel the femoral artery and then uh, proceed with the nerve block. Put your finger there or something, I don't know, I'll, I'll give a bit of pen mark there. The, the thing is, though, Mr. J, you're, you're, you're doing the injection dynamically. So as you're injecting, uh, you're not taking the probe away as mm. you're, you know, once you've identified where you are, which requires a lot of dexterity, of course. You it know? does, yeah, it does. And, uh, and, and, and the thing is, as you're injecting, you have to always see the tip of your needle mm. and you have to always aspirate, okay? And basically, the... Um, uh, you know, the in terms of how you're going to do it and what you're going to do, obviously, you know, you shouldn't be going away from this lecture, you know, from this talk and start doing it. All right. This is this is just to, you know, give you some knowledge um, and and a bit about the skills and the behavior. But this will not replace a package that you have to do. You know, you have to, you know, go away, read about this. I'm, I'm not here to teach you in one lecture how to do all these things. You know, these are procedural skills. Um, that will obviously it's got its own sort of way of um, getting competent and be safe. You know, as Mr. J says, you know, you have to be safe. Uh, these are, you know, if you get into trouble with any of these things, you know, these will be never events. You know, if you start injecting into the vessels or if you, you know, um, inject the other side, you know, where there is no fracture, these are never events. You know, you don't want to do that. Yeah, the other thing is, is... Uh... You know, whatever you do, it's not a hundred percent that hundred percent people will be having the factor, the pain, pain relief. Sometimes it fails. So I would err on the failure side rather than you know trying to be perfect and uh, you know injuring yeah. the vital structures. Yeah. So because yeah. once we injure the vital structures, so that uh, is uh, daunting because you can't uh, uh, take it out, take it away. But failure of stuff, of course, procedure failed, you know, so. Absolutely. So in terms of the, in terms of the probe, as we were saying, let's just recap. So it's the obliquely pointing towards the umbilicus and it's about one third, the lateral, where the one third and the, the yeah, lateral the and the medial, you know, you start from there, but remember you're scanning, okay? So you're looking for those landmarks, all right? 
So, you know, it's not exact science where, uh, you know, it's not like anatomical landmark where you start, you know, exactly one centimeter below the inguinal ligament and you're injecting between the lateral third and the medial third. This is the dynamic scanning and this is the beautiful thing about doing it uh, uh, ultrasound guidance because everybody's as Mr. J says everybody's anatomy is different you know the position is different as the leg is shortened and extended rotated you know things are sort of distorted uh, so this is the beautiful thing about doing it this this way um, so hopefully that has explained it now in terms of the pen block as I said I'm not going to dwell on this too much okay but the the inf uh, infra inguinal block you're you're your probe position will be, you know, as you would go where you would normally go for um, the anatomical landmark. Um, this is where you will be approximately. But remember, your needle is now not going perpendicularly as you would do it anatomically. Your needle is going in, a, in an angle. So in terms... Sorry. So so your needle will be going in an angle rather than perpendicular. So you will be a bit more lateral than you think you will be with anatomical. Does that make sense? Because... You know, um, anatomically, you go, okay, this is my medial third, this is my middle third, this is my lateral third, and then you go in between here, don't you? And then you go, uh, you go perpendicular. But with ultrasound, you, you know, you have the probe like that, and you're, you need to come in an angle, all right? So as you come in in an angle to reach where you want to get, you know, your your imagine, uh, you know, as you can imagine, you'll be much more laterally. Where you enter will be much more laterally. All right. So I hope that makes sense. Okay. Now with the femoral nerve block for femoral shaft fractures, whether that's in children or a farmer or whoever there is, you know, might be in a motorbike accident. Uh, you're you're much more. So you're still on the same uh, in the same plane. Okay, almost parallel to the to the inguinal ligament, but you're you're going a bit more medially, all right? And once you identified where the femoral artery is, it's just lateral to the femoral artery and you do the injection. But remember, as I said, if you're not comfortable doing that and the patient needs pain relief for femoral shaft fracture, just do the fasciolar lack compartment block, all right? Just do it as you would normally do it because remember that with a still block, you know, uh, the femoral nerve, um, um, and, uh, you know, just do that. If, if you feel more comfortable just doing the fascia and lacquer compartment block and learning that and getting very good at it, just do that even for the femoral shaft fractures because it will get the femoral nerve block. Uh, it will get the femoral nerve, sorry. Uh, if yeah. that, all right, is that okay? Nick, I might be speaking on behalf of everyone, actually. So when terms... we are there next, we might actually want to see it kind of done live rather quite quick practice session with uh, the probing and what image we'll be seeing and what we'll be comfortable with. I think I'm very comfortable with the anatomical part of it, but I know it's getting obsolete because once it's a two pop technique, the two pop may be, the third pop may be the bone and you don't realize you've gone a little bit deeper. You have to like start from the beginning. Yeah. You have avoided the artery all the time, but you might not know where you have injected. No, you need what to you're saying, yeah. DOPS is it. So we have a DOPS, uh, what they call DOPS, what it does, DOPS procedure. Directly uh, observed procedures. So, yeah. Um, so I think I think that thing need to be learned by DOPS and by signing the package, because I think the package is you must have a level one uh, mm -hmm. in a lecture sort of face to face then you need to have the part to the finishing school where you have to have evidence of so many uh, them things done and the log and whatever. And then you are signed off by Nick or, you know, who is uh, ultrasound set of lead. And then you are allowed to do all this stuff. And then again, some people do need, do a lot of teaching before, you know, to, to get uh, proficiency before they are you know, fully sort of uh, qualified. And because, because these are the aids, like a scan something, but the anatomy, if uh, you know the anatomy, because I think, I think uh, you know, before ultrasound scan, people used to do this stuff, uh, you know. Uh, we used to do a nerve stimulator, like a femoral nerve block and cotyledon. Uh, that used to be very good, but never get, uh, you know, sight of the anatomy, which Nick is uh, stressing. Anatomy is very important and the, 
topographical landmarks of the of the anatomical area. Yeah. Uh, so, so interesting. Thank you very much, Mr. Jay. That's very useful. Again, you know, uh, as Mr. Jay is pointing, interestingly enough, the ACPs, okay, so Alice, um, Alice has written a package for fascia like compartment block for the ACPs. And I think um, uh, Mr. Uh, Balasteros has looked at it and is now going through the educational, um, the, the educational department. I, I, you know, I, I, uh, I haven't looked at it, I don't know what it's like, but essentially that's the whole idea, as Mr. Jay says, that, you know, you've got a package whereby, you know, somebody who's not done this before, uh, is a novice, can then go through it stepwise to acquire this competency. It's and on it's not, my ED, I yeah. think it's my, on, on my ED as well. Is it now? Okay, yeah, fair enough. So, so basically, you know, what we're saying is that you shouldn't be going away from this lecture or, or just like seeing a video on YouTube or whatever, you know, start then, you know, doing it uh, solo and, you know, say that, you know, this is independent practice now. You know, you, you know this is a competency. And as you know, the, 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 the new curriculum of Arkham is competency based, okay, which I'm not going to go through just for the sort of purpose of the talk, but essentially, you know, you have to... Um, acquire and maintain these skills and those knowledge and behaviors in a very progressive way. And you, you start with the basic and as you're going through training, you're getting more advanced and you're maintaining what you've got as well. So it's not like, you know, you do this one time and then that sets like you get signed off and you will never be seen doing this again. You have to be seen doing it again. You need to keep a log book, you know, and all you know so that when when if something goes wrong which it does you know uh, to the most experienced people you know things kind of still go wrong but then you can turn around and say well i've done this many you know of this procedure um yeah okay you know this one time it went wrong for whatever reason um so basically i think as you say uh, we need to get a training package together uh, so watch this space and just for the interest of time, I'm just going to continue. I've got two more slides. OK, so this is the first one. So as you might know, local anesthetic toxicity, you need to know about it. OK, um, when you're performing this procedure or anything else that uh, involves local anesthetic, but particularly this procedure, because as we said, you know, you're near the vessels, big vessels, and you need to know how to deal with local anesthetic toxicity. And you might have come across this guideline called uh, from AAGBI. The long and short of it is, is if you think that somebody has got local anesthetic toxicity, you inadvertently inject it into the vessel or you're giving them too much of a dose. And that's why I'm saying that it's very important you calculate your dose correctly. I know we've got a performer, but you're still, you know, it's a still a good practice to just calculate for that patient how much you're going to give. In children, it becomes even more important, of course. But the long and short of it is, you know, they might get some tingling to start up with around the mouth. Um, they might get some palpitations and so on. So these are the early signs and then they proceed from there and they might even go into cardiac arrest. Uh, but let's say they start with tingling around the mouth. You need to start from A to E, okay? Just simple assessment of A to B. You might want to put some oxygen on and so on. Uh, if you're injecting at the time, you need to stop injecting. And then one of the things that you, we need to have handy in the department is 20% uh, lipid emulsion, okay? And again, this guideline will tell you how much you need to then administer to uh, help with this toxicity. So again, I'm not gonna dwell too much on this guideline. You need to go away and have a look at it. All right? Once now, um, this is an important sort of uh, point to make in terms of, you might ask, well, why is it that, you know, we, we observe patients for about uh, 30 minutes after you've given this, uh, you know, after you've done this procedure and why do they have to be in a cubicle where they are seen? The reasoning for that is, is because uh, sometimes, you know, these patients get 10 milligrams of morphine, sometimes more, you know, they might get it, you know, uh, at the front door as well. And you come along and do this procedure and you take most of the stimuli, if not all of the stimuli away, which was that pain. You might have seen it when we do procedural sedation, you know, at the start, you know, you put a bit of a propofol and fentanyl in, the patient is still talking and everything, you know, and then let's say that, the, you know, shoulder dislocation, it, it goes back in and then they go flat, you know, because you've taken that stimulus uh, of the pain away 
And now the, the drugs are now working as suppressing somebody centrally. So there was, a, the, there was this uh, safety flashcard from Arkham to highlight there was a case where a lady was left in a cubicle, was not observed after this procedure was done, and she went into respiratory arrest. I don't know whether she died or not. So it's very, very important after you've performed this procedure that the patient gets observed, they have the vital signs, the neuro, especially neurology and respiratory, every five minutes. I think in our department, it might be every 15 minutes, if I'm not mistaken, uh, for 30 minutes. And they need to be in somewhere where that you can see them. Uh, I hope this makes sense. This is not just about opiate toxicity, but also this is about, um, actually the other point of it is to do with local anesthetic toxicity as well. Now, some departments have got a policy that this, this procedure is only done in resource because then you get closer monitoring. But obviously, you know, it's, it's not very realistic, especially in our department to get somebody to resource to do these things uh, all the time, all right? And moving on then. Um, so in terms of training, all right, this is a model that uh, I and uh, Dr. Moet Aurora in Leeds, who is actually the lead for the, for the deanery ultrasound currently, came up with. So this is one of the ways when we talked about training and education, this is one of the ways to get training, all right? So you can use chicken breasts and some party balloons and wires, and you can assemble them in such a way that will resemble uh, the anatomy. And then you can, you know, practice as much as you want to get your bearings right. Now you can use a sandwich bag, all right? It, um, the, the One of the chicken breasts can go into the sandwich bag and, uh, Either layers of the sandwich bag will act as the fascia uh, layers. And I'll show you what it looks like when you scan as well. And you can actually feel the pops and you can inject under it. You can get a nice type of dissection. So hopefully this is something that we can practice in our department, um, you know, in one of the sessions once we get the package going, okay? Um, now, so there we go. So here, here's what you can see uh, with this model. Okay, so you can get you can get what resembles the fascia lata. You can get what re resembles the fascia agiaca. Uh, you have a wire which I used just uh, you know I had an old bike which I just took the brake wires off and put it in, and you get a nice uh, sort of what represents the nerve there. And you, you go in and you can just then inject on the um, and you get all the tactile feel. Uh, it's a great practice. We've been using this model for the last two, three years on the deanery courses, and it's well received. We've got, we got loads of feedbacks now. I think we've got over 100 students' feedback on the tactile feel, on the sonographical look of it, um, and, and everything else. And uh, we currently have, have, have submitted this to be published. Um, so hopefully, you know, this will be published soon, the results of it and this model. Okay. So this. So there we go. So this is in we are, uh, This is using that model, and you can see a nice hydro dissection there. This is in one of our deanery courses. Okay. So that's it. That's the end of my talk. So basically, in summary, I've gone through ultrasound guided fascia iliac compartment and femoral nerve blocks. Um, and as I keep stressing, and as Mr. J rightly says as well, you know this is a competency-based thing, you know, you can't just go away now and practice. You need to be uh, going through training and getting signed off and, you know, be closely supervised until you do however many scans. And yeah, um, but as I said, I'm a big fan of this. We shouldn't be doing it anatomically anymore. The reasoning for not doing it anatomically, do you see any of the anesthetists doing any, any uh, nerve blocks anatomically anymore? Yeah, you won't. And neither would you see an anesthetic doing central lines, you know, central venous lines used to be done anatomically, you know. Um, it's, you don't see them doing the, that anymore. It's frowned up on, you know, in the NICE guidelines, it says it has to be done ultrasound guided because we've got the technology there, okay? We just need to upskill people, and make it safer for the patient, make it more safer and effective, all right? So please ask me any questions you've got now. No, I think it was a very good talk. I think, I think the point is uh, because the, the radiologist, uh, you know, so you know what? They are good in two things. One is anatomy and one is the physics. 
Yeah. Hence, they can interpret any set of problem. You know, the ultra, the, the scan of the abdomen, they know where the mesenteric artery is, what the branches of the aortic artery, where the bowels are. Similarly, in ultrasound of uh, any part, so first we must know the anatomy. And then, because these are the gray shades under the scan, you don't know what they are. But if we really know where the iliacus muscle is, where the, as um, uh, Nick was saying, sauce tendon is, where the sauce muscle is, what the origin, what the insertion, where the fascia, uh, uh, you know, lata comes, and then the fascia iliaca. And then you look them lines under the scan, you see the gray line, the white line, and then you are sure that's what's happening there. So first we must be reading the anatomy really. Yeah. And then the bit of physics of the scan, as you're saying, is a credit card thin beam of the scan, uh, which is very difficult to grapple. Uh, so when I do something under the scan, these are things which bother my mind really. So I think uh, then you proceed further. So yeah, please, uh, you know, we, we, we can't be, uh, what we say, like adventurous seeker. So no. we are the clinician. Uh, you know, so we we use the scene making process, which uh, we were talking about, and we are very flexible, and we we are not persisting. No, I have to have to give this. Not at all. If I mean, if one attempt uh, by I fail, I won't persist. You know, I'll ask somebody else. They come, sorry, uh, you know, I fail. Can you please help? And and this always work. Believe me, it always work. It doesn't mean that. You don't know a scan yet, you don't know what the linear probe is, or you don't know the anatomy. So there's no ego involved here because here is a patient. If I'm a patient, I don't want people to keep me poking with a needle, not at all. Yeah, please be absolutely. flexible. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Safety is paramount, as, as Mr. J says, and getting the basic right is paramount. You need to go back to the books, read about the anatomy and so on. And you, you need to know just the basics of ultrasound. And as you go through ultrasound training, hopefully you get to know the physics, the artifacts, you know, and everything else. Uh, it, won't, it won't happen overnight. You know, don't expect it to happen overnight. You need to be proactive. You, we are, we're all adult learners here. You know, you need to make, uh, you know, point of what you want to learn as well. Uh, it's not just about, you know, everybody else coming and, you know, teaching you. You need to go away. Uh, you know what you know what you need to learn and also you know sometimes there are things that are coming up that you know you realize ah this is what I need to learn because you've reflected on it and you or somebody else might have given you a feedback and or something might have gone wrong um, and you then realize you need to go through this now just to finish off then so this is you might have come across this you might have not but this is widely available now on Arkham website this is the new syllabus for the point of care ultrasound um, uh, with the new curriculum, which was introduced in August. And I was part of the, the committee who wrote this. OK, um, and essentially what is, is, is that this is the this is what you need to learn. All right. So you got the diagnostic side of it. You've got the procedural side of it. OK, we went through the fascia and compartment block. You already know um, with the vascular access, the central and peripheral. And you need to know the, the usual things. Now, this year, uh, as well, what we introduced was shock assessment and uh, pleural ultrasound, um, which I'm not going to go through just because of the, uh, the timing, but we can go through that at some uh, at another teaching at a later date. Um, but essentially, the uh, you know, if if you if you find this uh, document, I can share it as well. Uh, I can put it in the share drive, you know, you go through it, then you get a good idea in terms of what you need to do now for ultrasound, because it's, How big is the document, Nick? Sorry, how big is it? How big is it? It's only a few pages, Mr. J. You just ask uh, uh, Firas to put on my ED. Yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Put on I'll, my ED. I'll, I'll definitely, yes, that's a very yeah. good idea. So, so this is official, and uh, now I'm sort of, I'm now the vice chair of the training and the education of um, point of care ultrasound for Arkham, we're just sort of coming up with all the smaller prints, if you like, as to how people get competencies. Because the difference is now that, you know, it's not, as you know, with the older model, you had to go through the level one course, and then you had to get triggered assessment and have finishing in school and everything. 
And, you know, there was, there was, you know, that model didn't really work in the way that, you know, uh, people would just kind of focus on it and just get it all done, get it all signed off. It was a tick box exercise for people to do. Now we're trying to move away from that model and we're trying to come up with a model whereby people are actually acquiring their skills and they're maintaining it and they're progressively getting more advanced with these skills, okay? Uh, so watch this space. I can share this with, uh, with you. I think, I, think, I think, Nick, that's a very important point because this one, uh, since I started working in a &E, you know, of course, you know, uh, start from junior, whatever. So I was wondering why we spend money to go outside, do course, and then forget about. Oh no, no, no. I think, no. I think, I think yeah. you're absolutely right because you are on this committee. Please bring it to the masses. Bring in the department. Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, so absolutely. everything should emanate from the department. The scan, the ALS, ATLS. We don't have to go somewhere. Believe me, if that culture will come to ED, then the ED will be advanced. Otherwise, you know, it's just like going there then forgetting about. I think the scan is something which I would love to be working and flourishing and uh, everything been happening uh, in, in, in on, on, on the shop floor, quite frankly. You know, yeah. people like you, people like, uh, you know, Vaan, Vaan has done some sort of MSc when going to university for a couple of years to do all this stuff. So I think, um, you know, I think it should be happening on the shop floor really. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you. I think, you see, Arkham uh, got very, uh, very cross um, when this came in initially, you know, into the curriculum, because what they found was that, you know, there was all these private companies popping up and charging, yeah. charging trainees, you know, lots of money and everything. And, and they found that, you know, there was lots of conflict of interest. But actually, you know, the bottom line is we need to do this for education and we need to do it in-house. And we have the expertise, you know. Um, I've... Um, I've finished my PG cert and just finished my diploma as well. I'm just writing my master's dissertation in medical ultrasound. Um, Sharif is just, uh, he's studying the diploma just now. So we have, you know, the expertise. Obviously, there's Balasteros who's done diploma in ultrasound, you know. So there are these expertise around and we can make it happen. No, um, absolutely. It should be on the shelf floor. Absolutely, it, it can it can definitely happen, and and again, ju just um, so so this is the, this table is very important as well. So you can see, you know, it's pointing towards doing everything, you know, in a very a slow fashion. Okay, so you start in what what, what would be the equivalent? Um, you know, I, I appreciate you know this is a deanery kind of steps, you know, ST six and ACCS and so on, but this this model can very much you know. Uh, uh, play into the Caesar and the him training where, you know, you start the slowly, okay, you know, in the first six months or a year, you aim to get certain competencies, then in your second year, you know, you start getting more uh, competent and so on. And also you're maintaining all these skills that you're learning at the start. You're not just forgetting about it because you've been signed off on it. Okay, that's the difference between a competency-based model, uh, which is coming now, compared to the older school whereby it's just a tick box exercise. This is no more the tick box exercise that we had. This is something that is competency-based and you have to maintain a local kind of everything to show that you're safe and you're engaging with it. And as Mr. J. Wright says, we need to have this on the shop floor in the education medical center, you know, um, and we need to get everybody, you know, um, uh, competent and supervised correctly. And hopefully, you know, this is very enjoyable. I really enjoy ultrasound. It's a very enjoyable thing. You know, it's point of care. You know, you can make a lot of difference. In fact, the more experience I get, the more selective I become in terms of who I scan. Because first of all, when you're learning, you scan everybody. But actually, you can raise more questions than answers. So now, you know, I do it very selectively and I ask a very binary question and I want to make a difference to the patient. You know, it's not about me, you know, um, as, as Mr. Jay says, it's not about, uh, you know, my ego, whatever. It's about how can I help the patient, you know, with doing this. Um, okay, so um, has anybody else got any questions? Please ask. Yeah, it's a, it's a basically um, usual question when you're on the shop floor. Let's say, for example, next time we um, I see someone with a neck of femur fracture, um, who do I ask in terms of helping with the ultrasound procedure versus 
myself going on with the anatomical just work just that I was just, doing it. Yeah, just direct question to Epic. Epic will know. I will know the skill of my team. When I'm working, I know Nick is good in that. I know Nashad is good in uh, peripheral venous success. Mm -hmm. So I, I know the skill of my team. When I'm on call, just direct this question to me. I will absolutely okay. be asking. Uh, no, no, Prajwal, there's nobody there. Can we not do like uh, old method, like anatomical method? Anatomical method is not phased out, not at all. You right. know, if you are good in anatomy, uh, you know, so it's not a crime, you know, because here you are trying to help people. It might fail. Of course, it fail in ultrasound scan as well. So it might fail, but, uh, you know, if you think your patient need a lack of block and it works and there's no contraindication. So I think, uh, you know, we are not uh, saying that, no, people should not be using uh, old anatomical method, okay? So ultrasound is fat because it's more safer, but if we don't have anybody, then I think uh, we will go with the anatomy as well. My question is uh, just because when I saw the trolley, it was directed more towards the ultrasound procedure. Let's say, for example, if there is no one helping in the ultrasound, do I use the same trolley? Of course. Um, I do use the same probe, I can understand that, but it's a little bit different than what we use for the anatomical versus the ultrasound probe. If Nick can uh, explain that a little bit, please. Uh, sorry, ask ask the question again, sorry. Just so what I mean to say is the, the trolley that I use, the FICB block, you know, the, the wound pack and uh, the probe, and the needle. I think I think um, I think the project you are you might be confusing about the needle available there. Am I right? Yeah. So the as I understand the plastic needle is for the femoral nerve block. Okay. And uh, I will say the toy needle. Can you use the toy needle? I think we could use under scan as well because I think it will be better. You can see better uh, tape of the needle in the scan. I think that's that's what you might be confusing the different needle available there. Am I right? Um, it's not only about the needle. Basically, the whole package, it looks like it's uh, it's accessible for mainly the ultrasound guided one rather than the anatomical one. So if no, Nick can Equipment is the same. I there. don't think so there's any difference in the equipment. Equipment is the same, you know. So, so but there are different. There's, a, there's one plastic sort of tube available, is it? Yeah, I think I think the, the the equipment is very much the same. Um, I think that's, that's a small. He's talking about very small gauge needle. I think about needle is uh, twenty five gauge something, uh, long th thin needle. So that's for the femoral nerve block to me. I don't think so. You can use for this uh, facial nerve block. Um, to to be very very honest with you, I I I, I appreciate what Mr. J says in the in sense of you know do it anatomically personally personally i would disencourage that personally mr j okay and i think i think it's that, that i appreciate what you say and i think that it does happen very widely now you know it's still lots of people you know well, if i mean after middle of the night if there's nobody available yeah you know and uh, you have to ease the pain but then it works and that winkle block does work you know so if we give it properly it does work you, you're right. So, so you've got no other option, isn't it? You know, you've got no other option than if you're going to, and, and it's been used for a long time now, you know, and it's been used, uh, you know, like that. But I think hopefully what we can do is we can, the, the main uh, the point here is that we need to upskill our trainers. You're absolutely right. We, yeah, yeah. We need to upskill our trainers, okay, which is not going to, you know, happen again overnight. All right. As, as Mr. J says, you need to go to the epic, see, okay, is there somebody that, can 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 supervise you. And personally, I've been supervising quite a lot of, you know, uh, trainees on the shop floor in Doncaster, you know, to to make sure that yeah, yeah. They do this level one course in Doncaster now, is it? Level one course you can have it at Doncaster. Then the signing ups you can have from the department. Well, hopefully that's the plan. I think uh, obviously you know I'm not the uh, I'm not the lead at the moment. I'm I'm not a consultant. Um, no, you know, they do they do they do so often uh, at uh, learning center level one because I spend about thousand pound with some sort of informed company in London, and I still remember they were very bloody very cold there than them days. So it cost me oh it's about a few years ago it cost me now where I think is a tremendous amount of money, you know. 
it is. It's it's unfortunately that that's what's happened. You know, it's in training, but then it's asking trainees to then go away and spend money or whatever. Or 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 and and also, you know, people as as Mr. J says, you know, you might have not when you trained, you know, before, you know, you might have not gone through ultrasound training. So then you need now need to upskill, and then you now need to sort of spend money out of your own pocket to then go away and and train. Um, I think the key here, as Mr. Jay says, the key here is that we need to, you know, uh, set it up all locally in such a way that it's accessible. You know, it doesn't cost anybody any money and that will help everybody. You know, it, it will help, you know, the department. It will help your patients. It will hopefully help the safety as well. So on yeah, that the other thing is the more you the more you do, the more you play with it, the better confidence you get. So it's not uh, no, we, we, we are not scaring junior that no no don't go near to ultrasound scan not at all please hold it see it what it is get more familiar to it because if we won't touch it we won't see it then that fear factor and the anxious factor will be there so yeah be relaxed and uh, you know play with it when money is on the shop floor or whatever just go with it and see how how they do it help it hold the probe hold the needle but, but under supervision, you know, so how we do it, you see what I mean? So, so get into it. That's the main thing. No, I, I, I agree with Nick that uh, ultrasound guided uh, fascia lacquer block is certainly the way forward. Um, the, the, you know, the, the is certainly safer. The only, the only thing I was going to comment on is the practicality within our own department. Yeah, yeah, you're right. In terms of, because this is a competency-based procedure. Uh, it's it's a, almost a it's really an apprentice. This competency, realistically, you need real patients, um, and and you need and it's an apprentice-style learning, which means that the first so many times that you want to do it, you really should be having a somebody more competent, like like Nick yourself, to be there not just physically be around, also be available and also be willing. Absolutely, supervising, help. yeah. Yeah, so the challenge I think in our current department is the, to have the presence of all three factors in the same person at the point where you have the, uh, uh, the appropriate patient for that is going to be rare as hands teeth. Yeah. All three think... factors I'm talking about. So, so, so all three factors is key available, willing to help, and actually have the skill to actually teach and supervise at that point. I learned my, I mean, I've done, I have learned the ultrasound guided fascia lacquer block, but actually not from this department at all. It was where I was specifically asked for it when I went over to anesthesia. And, and because I specifically asked for it, um, a whole series of uh, anesthetic consultants specifically chose a list for me to join to, for me to practice doing it. But did I get any of this opportunity in the department? None. And I think that's going to be the challenge. I think there's, it's going to be a wholesale of upskilling of even the supervisors in terms of their own skills and also the top process of actually imparting the skills when they have it. I, I, think, I think we are... It's we, difficult we are, at normally... this point. Normally we are bugged down with the businesses. Eh? Normally we're bugged down with the business. The department is 80, 90 people waiting. You see what I mean? So the department is not conducive, quite frankly. Uh, so, all the factors so are there, factors. but uh, that stuff is not, sometimes we don't have a cubicle, you know? We yeah. used to have and, a- and, 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 and I suppose this, the challenge then is if you don't have these three factors in, uh, in other words, you don't have somebody who's able to supervise and ensure yeah, that you do, do it. a, a, a yeah. ultrasound guided version safely. What do you do if you have a patient that does need a fascia lacquer block and the only skill you have or what you need people that, who knows how to do it is and uh, is landmark I, based, then uh, what choice do you have? Can I just come in in this? I, yeah, I, yeah. I think um, I think I I have to say this is not the not only the local challenge within Doncaster and Bassett Low. Believe me, it's, it's a challenge nationally. It's challenged nationally. And what we're doing is, uh, so as a committee now, uh, this is a newly formed committee with Arkham, which I'm a vice chair of. What we're doing now is we're scheduling uh, events uh, called Train the Trainers, okay? 
uh, which is not going to be in London um, uh, uh, solely. Uh, I've made a point of it that it should not be in London. It should be up in Scotland, in the north as well, you know, around uh, our sort of Leeds, Sheffield area, um, and also some in London. And in that way, we can then uh, invite the trainers to come along to these events to then upskill them, you know, so that... I, I, I agree. But, but what I'm saying is in the interim... Oh, these are all very aspirational Inter interim until we have a, a, an environment that can actually support the upskilling we're going to and uh, continue doing the landmark approach so, so you, 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 you you basically touched upon a very important point uh, in the sense that uh, for example in training when you're going through ACCS and you do the critical care and and also you do the anesthetic block you know for 6 months each yeah. And then you go to acute medicine as well, because as you know, acute medicine, they, they have an ultrasound package as well called Famous. Uh, Ahmed is the lead, you know, in, in, in Doncaster. Um, so what you want to do is you want to find these opportunities, okay? So if, you, if it means that you've got a non-clinical day, all right, then you've got to use that wisely, all right? We are all adult learners and if you've got a non-clinical day, uh, you know, you're employed by the trust, you can approach a, a approach uh, uh, if, if it's the blocks, you can go and approach one of the consultant colleagues, go to the trauma meetings, you know, the orthopedic trauma meetings, approach them, just say, look, you know, I'm here to learn, you know, I want to learn this specific skills, these are my learning needs, and go along and learn them, because those are the best people to learn from, actually. And then equally, if you want to learn to do echo scans, for example, or you want to learn to do uh, abdominal scans or whatever, uh, then you can go to critical care. So nowadays, as you know, they have a package called FUSIC and they learn to how to do echoes and so on. So we need to use the skills not within our department, just within our department. We need to use it more widely within the trust. You can um, go to radiology department. Uh, 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 yeah. uh, Jai, Jai Soni is the ultrasound specialist. He's very good in that. You know, just spend time with yeah. him, you know. I, I, I think, think the lack of help available is. I think, I think the ultrasound department, Mr. J, it's it's a bit tricky in the sense that I think they've got lots of radiographer students. For for example, I think we've had colleagues who wanted to get there to learn how to do the biliary scan or renal scan, and mm. I think they've had a bit of a pushback. Uh, whereas I think it's it, it's probably you find if you go to acute medicine, for example, you can learn how to do DBTs if Ahmed is there or some of the other colleagues is there, because I think he's upskilled quite a lot of the consultants to famous now. Um, so you can go and learn how to do longer scan from Ahmed or do DBT scan. Obviously, I can do all of those. But as you say, you know, uh, Sharif, myself, uh, Ballesteros and some other people who are good at uh, ultrasound we won't be always around so it's the, it's it's basically being an adult learner and seeking these opportunities okay you're not going to learn equally equally you're not going to learn how to do central lines you know in a and e you know um uh, it, it's just the way it is i think uh, we have to use the trust um, yes, yes, around yes, us yes, as yes, resources yes, yes, yes. As, as learning resources and learning opportunities and then hopefully over time, you know, it's an aspiration that we upskill everybody oh, so yes. that in, the, in our department itself, you know, we can have many people uh, that are uh, competent in doing this uh, so that we don't have to go, you know, excellent. to other departments. So, yeah, Nick. yeah, Nick, it was excellent, uh, you know, very good perspective. I think, um, you know, hopefully you applied for the job is it? So hopefully you will be working with us very soon. Now, guys, uh, one thing which uh, is uh, bugging us is the uh, first fit clinic referral. I think, uh, you know, there are a lot of stuff they are emailing me. Uh, Sometimes we don't um, uh, fax them the ECG. Somehow they like ECG. I don't know why, you know, why they want ECG and epilepsy. <laughs> they want to refer to Nick, uh, uh, you know, uh, favorite uh, phrases to ACU. I don't it's know. It's usually the long QT syndrome is what they wanted to actually you're check. Absolutely, there because... you're, you're absolutely right. We, when we know that, please send them ECG as well. And the second part is uh, they tell me that the the writing they receive is not, uh, you know, um, as a half writing or something like that. I don't know why they can't see it. So I think, I think I've seen if we write in one or two boxes only, so that's better for these are reference. So we don't have to write in every box on the symphony. 
I normally just finish in one box really as, as normal nodes. So I've seen if we do that, so this is betterly, you know, in a better way we could fax them or whatever. I think these are the main two issues they, they are always emailing me. They've emailed me even now today, one is John Taylor, Joyce Taylor. So they need an ECG and one is a Craig, uh, Craig Possel and they want a proper note to be signed. So I think uh, now tomorrow I will uh, sort this out. But I think because epilepsy is, if somebody is lost in the system and he is uh, driving away everything and if he got a fit and uh, you know, on a motorway, you can imagine, you know, what havoc it will be there, you know? So yeah, please, uh, uh, you know, this is a quite nasty sort of disease, nasty diagnosis. So we must be careful about these sort of uh, referral and these sort of diagnosis. Yeah, please make a make a effort uh, to to be to be a little bit perfect uh, while we refer to the first fit clinic. And the, the other other issue is uh, you know because I think the frailty uh, practitioner they they want us to use them more often. They have a complaint we don't use them. They work from nine to six, twenty four seven every week. So I think uh, rather than talking to the medical doctors and uh, having a bad taste in the mouth and argument and whatever, the frailty practitioners, they are very nice. They, they won't argue as a doctor do. They will invariably accept the patients. It's very easy to talk to and uh, you know really good. Yeah, please, uh, we should be using them a lot uh, in our frail patients rather than you know, speak to the medical doctors. So these are two, uh, you know, issues which uh, I've been told to highlight uh, to, to yourself, please. I think is there anything else to, to be done or should we split or should we finish or should we continue all of the afternoon, I don't know.